Amen. 1 Samuel 3, uh, we move from seeing the birth, the miraculous birth of Samuel, his mother, Hannah, uh, in unfortunate circumstances, barren, unable to have children. She petitions God. Uh, She's misunderstood in a lot of ways, but God understands her perfectly. And God has a plan for her and for her life and to give life to her womb. And she uh, has a, she gets pregnant and she brings her son, Samuel, after the time of weaning, two or three years old, somewhere in there, brings him to the tabernacle to be raised uh, by Eli. And of course, Eli has the two uh, wicked sons, Hopni and Phineas, that are going to be his now stepbrothers, I guess. They're older. Don't picture them as real young like uh, Samuel is, but they're somewhat older. But nonetheless, he's now raised in this foster family situation as a as an intern, an apprentice, even as a three-year-old, as an apprentice there in the house of God, doing things that were age-appropriate. They don't send him out with a butcher knife to slaughter the big oxen, you know. It's going to be age-appropriate, but God is, is working in his life, and Eli is going to teach him the ropes, and we move from in chapter 2, uh, seeing the highlight on just the, the corruption in Eli's house and the challenges, the prophecy that God brings through this unnamed prophet to, uh, to Samuel, or excuse me, to Eli, uh, God is speaking to him about the situation, how Eli honored his sons more than God. And chapter 3 begins with now the boy Samuel. So he moves from a child, Samuel is a child in chapter 2, but now he's a boy. Uh, the historian Josephus says that Samuel would have been about 12 years old. So maybe if he was somewhere around there, little less, little more, maybe 12, 16, who knows exactly how old he was, but he's called a boy, so we know he's not an adult, he's, a, uh, he's, he's young. It says, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. He was there learning the ropes of tabernacle service, learning how to do and engage in the priestly service. Interestingly, he was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and his, his boys, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's boys, were ministering to themselves apart from Eli. Eli tried to correct them. They wouldn't have anything to do with being corrected. So we have this contrast between Samuel and these other boys, Hophni and Phinehas. And we're, we just get the setup here in chapter 3. We get the setup of this. You know, We know this takes place in the time of the judges. Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. They'd reject God as their king. And we see the results of that. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Maybe your Bible says precious. Precious and rare kind of go hand in. When something is rare, that makes it precious. It's valuable. But the, the idea here is the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. So there was no identified national man of God speaking for God, recognized by the nation. Even if you go through the book of Judges, from what I could see, You can check me on this. There were only two prophets mentioned in the entire book of Judges. Deborah was a prophetess, and then there was a prophet mentioned in uh, Judges chapter 6 with Gideon. But you can check me on that. We see a few appearances of the angel of the Lord, but all in all, in the book of Judges, there was a lot of disunity, a lot of disharmony, a lot of idolatry, and no widespread revelation. There was no prophet speaking for God. Much like uh, if you turn from the end of the book of Malachi to the beginning of the book of Matthew, what you may not realize is that 400 plus years transpires in that turn of the page. We call that the intertestamental period, a time when there was no recognized prophet speaking in Israel. It wasn't the the silent years. Many say, oh, those were the silent years. They were not silent by any means. There was a lot happening in and around Israel and, and who was reigning over them and what was happening with them and Greek culture being introduced and Antiochus Epiphanes and all of these things that were happening. So it wasn't silent, but there was no, there was no word of God. God no, 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 nobody speaking for God until enter on the scene John the Baptist. And he begins to say, hey, repent. The kingdom of the Lord is at hand. Make way. It brings this message in. And so, and same thing in those days of Judges, the word of the Lord rare, no widespread revelation that's, to me, a very sad thing. We're so blessed how much uh, we, ha- we have the Word of God. 
And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. So I think there's a, there's a tension drawn by the author, Samuel, we believe, to the darkness. Uh, notice what's said about uh, Eli. Well, he's lying down in his place, and his eyes were so dim he could not see. He lacked vision because he's an old man in a very practical sense, but that really paralleled his spiritual life, didn't it? He lacked vision. He didn't have a vision for refrain, you know, restraining his sons, and you know, he was a, had grown fat possibly in enjoying a little bit of the corruption of the tabernacle himself. So he could, his eyes were so dim he couldn't see, and it was nighttime. The lamp, uh, the, uh, the menorah, the lamp of the tabernacle is, is lit, but before it goes out, meaning in the morning is when they, the lamp is, is, uh, not, does, isn't needed anymore. And while Samuel was lying down, and that's when the Lord called. Notice, who did the Lord call? He called Samuel. I don't know if you find that interesting. I find that interesting. Why? Because Samuel's a boy. He could have called Hophni. Hey, get your life straight. I got work to do. Repent. You know, I want to work through you. He could have called Phineas, the other brother. Could have called anybody, but he chooses a boy, a young boy, 12-year-old boy. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. But before we move on to the next verse, a couple other things I noticed. I, I noticed just how responsive Samuel is to what he thinks is Eli's voice. Now, evidently, Samuel's in this place of helping to care for Eli, and evidently they slept in close quarters to one another, and when he hears this voice, it's the call of God, but he doesn't know it's the call of God. He thinks it's Eli, and Eli must need some help. Eli's blind. He's, he's 98 years old. He's probably somewhat disabled, hard to get around, so evidently Samuel kind of helps him, and so as soon as he hears that voice, as soon as he hears that call, He's up, and notice it says, he ran to Eli. Now, this is a 12-year-old boy, for, for argument's sake, somewhere around there, who hears the call of his parent, it was foster father, so to speak, and runs to see what he needs. Now, that is miraculous. To see any 12-year-old run when their parent calls them, say, here I am, what can I do for you? I mean, that's miraculous in and of itself. Would you agree with me? And that's marvelous. But it says something to us, as we talked about on Sunday, it says something to me about being faithful in the little things. Here's a kid who's responsive to the voice of authority. Here's a kid who re who's responsive to the voice of need. And, and he doesn't just hear it. We used to tell our kids, slow obedience is what? No obedience. To hear it and go, well, I'll get around to it later. To hear the, the, the request, to hear the call and say, well... Let, me, let some time go by, is really not obedience. Slow obedience is no obedience. And, and that's not the case for Samuel. Samuel runs to Eli and he says, here I am, you called me, so attentive. And this is a kid that's going to be attentive to the voice of God. Aren't, aren't, aren't we looking for people that are attentive to the voice of God? That we would hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us there's so many voices in our lives and so many things we, we attend to all kinds of other voices in our life. The voice that says, well, if you don't have one of these, you're nobody. If you don't do this, no one's going to love you. If you don't have that, if you don't go here, all of these voices. And Samuel, here's this voice. Again, it's nighttime, just as Cindy was sharing, this voice in the night. Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, second call. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So we have this little parenthetical statement. It seems that although Samuel had grown up around the ministry, he was learning how to do ministry, he was learning how to go through the motions, Yet he's going to have to develop a personal relationship with God himself, learning to hear the voice of God. Isn't that true of, of our own children? You may, uh, you know, my kids had the blessing of being raised in church. Now, 
for some, some preacher's kids, it's not so much of a blessing. We were always very careful to, to guard our kids and tell them, look, you don't obey because I'm the pastor. You don't have to put on your happy face because I'm the pastor. We never put that kind of pressure on our kids. You, you, do, you walk before the Lord first and foremost. But th- there's this feeling sometimes that, well, Dad, I don't have a testimony. I grew up in church. I, you know, I hear all these testimonies. Well, this guy was on drugs, and this person w- w- was, you know, failed businesses, and this person had this testimony, and that to all these people that, you know, we tend to honor those testimonies, the rags to riches, the, the I was in the gutter and drunk and an addict, and then God rescued me, and we go, oh, isn't that great? God is wonderful. And so our kids, you know, sometimes if you're raised in the church and you, you, you know what church is all about, but you feel like, I don't know if I have a, what's my testimony? My testimony is you're a sinner. Saved by the grace of God, I live with you. I know that. (laughs) Same testimony as anybody else has. We're sinners, born apart from God, born into sin, born self-willed. And then at some point, God gets a hold of my life, brings, uh, he, he forgives my sin, saves my soul, and my desire is to walk with him and obey him and love him as he, just in return for the love he's given me. That's a testimony. So uh, Eli uh, tells him, go back to sleep. Samuel just wasn't hearing, didn't know this was the voice of God. And and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Aren't you glad God doesn't give up after two times? Ah, this kid's not getting it. Forget it. So Samuel, uh, the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And so he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am. No, I don't know if he said it that way. We got add memory problems to the list of bad eyesight. Here I am, for you did call me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. So Eli, for as much difficulty he had with his own worship and his own ministry and his own children. He's perceptive enough at this moment to understand, oh, I see what's going on. The Lord is speaking. I mean, there was probably little expectation, certainly in in that place, for the Lord to speak. Remember, there was no widespread revelation. And so the fact that God is breaking this silence, that God is, is breaking in and speaking is phenomenal, but that he's speaking to this boy, I I think is even more phenomenal. You know, we... um, if you got my email today, I don't know if it went out to you, the teaser, I think we have very little expectation of what youth are capable of when it comes to the things of God. And I think maybe uh, the youth have little expectation of themselves. We have been so blessed in this church to see the young men and women, the young girls and boys, and just to see how God is speaking to them. And uh, it was said a uh, to me a number of years ago, and maybe I've shared this before, I'll share it again, that the youth aren't the future of the church. They are the church. Sometimes we can get stuck in our ways. We can get stuck in our rituals and stuck in our traditions. And sometimes God has to go to the young generation if he wants to do something new. Because sometimes us older folks, and I'll include myself in that category, uh, sometimes us older folks, well, we, we, we don't hear from God that way. Because God says something new not something strange, but maybe something, hey, something a little different, something a little new. And we go, no, 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 we've never done it that way before, God. And he's got to go to somebody young. Think about it. He goes to, when he wants to give birth to his son, he picks a a young girl, teenage girl, Mary, 14, 15, 16. When he wants to speak to his nation about the shallowness of their faith, he goes through Jeremiah. Remember what God says to Jeremiah? Jeremiah. You know, before I, I, I knew you, I called you to be a prophet. And what does Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 1.6, Jeremiah says, I'm just a youth. I can't do it. He was 12, somewhere between, I'm sorry, maybe between 14, 16 years old, Jeremiah was, somewhere in that age range, maybe 12, maybe 13. So now you understand when he says, I'm just a youth, and, I, and Jeremiah, I'm sending you. Now read Jeremiah thinking about a 12, 13, 14-year-old boy called to speak for God. You think about Timothy. 
Paul says to Timothy, hey, Timothy, let no one despise your youth. Why do you have to say that? Because people did. I mean, imagine if I said, you know what? God's calling me to step down from ministry. Oh, pastor, well, who's going to take over for you? Is it going to be Dave Blaha? Is it going to be Warren? Is it going to be, you know, Todd? Is it going to be Dave Vollmer? No, it's going to be Nick or Shane. They can't do it. Well, they're just young guys. You know, what can they do? They, they don't know what we know. Can they really lead the church? I mean, pastor, is that a good idea? Do you understand now why Timothy would be struggling as a young, maybe an 18-year-old guy, now leading the church? Let no one despise your youth. And Timothy, where Paul would go on to say to, about Timothy, no one, I have no one else like-minded. Everyone else seeks their own, except you who seek the things of Christ. Isn't that awesome? So here, when everyone else was seeking their own, Hophni, Phinehas, Eli in some ways, God speaks to a boy. Awesome, isn't it? Aren't you glad to see? Doesn't this generation, doesn't the 20-something generation, the teen generation now need kids who are attentive to the voice of God? Aren't you thankful to see young people attentive to the call of God in their lives? We have to be careful. Our challenge is not to squash them, but to embrace them and encourage them. Don't you think, church? Where's the church going to be if we squash? There's churches around uh, that would beg to have what you've seen in terms of young people. But that means, you know, we have to realize they don't think like us. They don't dress like us. They don't talk like us. They use a different language. They have different things that they talk about. They live in a different world. And our job is not to say to them, we'll figure out us. Our job is to say, we want to walk alongside of you. Paul's for Timothy's. Say, how can I encourage you in your faith? How can I give you place to serve and and value what God is doing in your life and in your generation? That's why I love this passage so much. What is it? the way it speaks to young people, the way it speaks to us. Of all the people God could have called, he chooses a boy. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. I think it's emphasized. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So Eli gives them good advice. Look, go back, go back to bed, and and keep your eyes shut, put your ears open while you're sleeping there. And if, he doesn't presume, he says, if the Lord calls you, if he calls you, here's what you say. You say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now the Lord, so Samuel went down and laid down in his place, verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. So now it's not just a voice, there's there's evidently a presence The Lord came and stood, that would get my attention, and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Now he gets it sort of right, but sort of wrong. He doesn't say, Lord. That's what Eli said, say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. But I don't know, maybe Samuel is nervous. Maybe he is surprised. Now the presence is there. Maybe he's just undone. And he leaves out the word, Lord, speak for your servant hears. And does God go, well, you didn't say Lord, sorry. You got to say it right. God is so much more gracious than we give him credit for. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. When's the last time you sat down to pray or sat down for Bible study? Personal devotion, and that's what you said. Most of the time when we go to prayer, we say, um, Lord, listen, because I'm going to speak. Here's what I want you to do. The Apostle Paul, Damascus Road, says, Lord, what do you want me to do? We show prayer is, is not uh, about getting God to do our will. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So wouldn't this be great if we showed up to our prayer time, we showed up to our our devotional time, we opened up our Bible, whatever our reading, and we said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And then we just began to read. Say, Lord, what are you saying? What do you want to say to me? What What do you want from me, Lord? What do you want to see my heart understand? 
What can I do to serve you? How can I worship you? Speak for your servant hears. Great thing to ask God. And then the Lord spoke. He didn't say, he didn't say Lord, he just, he just lays it out. You're ready for this, church? Are you ready to hear what the Lord spoke to Samuel? It's Samuel's first message from God. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle, be on fire. I mean, just this is going to be astounding stuff when, when God does this, whatever it is he's about to say. In that day, verse 12, I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. So you have to go back to the previous chapter. There was already, God had already come to Eli through a prophet and said, Eli, basically, I'm going to take the priesthood from you and give it to another, another line. You're, you're gonna, it's going to be torn from you. You have lost it, and it's too late. You can't get it back. Judgment is, has happened. And that one voice comes in. Now it's like God is bringing a second voice. He's confirming what he already said. He says, I'm going to do everything I said to Eli from beginning to end concerning his house. And he says, verse 13, here's, here's the reason, for I have told him. And I think the implication is I've been telling him. It's not like God just decides this out of the blue. Just like he woke up, he's having a bad day. He's like, eh, I'm having a bad day today. I'm kind of grumpy. I'm going to judge Eli. I don't think that's the way it works. I, I've told him that I will judge his house. He, he's told him that through this other prophet, that he will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. See, he knew it. It's not, again, he's not blindsiding him. Here's what it is, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. So these are older guys. It's not like young kids that he expected to go out and give them a spanking. But these were guys were older, and they were so corrupt, and there was an expectation of discipline, whether that's removing them from the priesthood. Has some way he was supposed to step in and purify, step in and restrain these guys from corrupting the ministry because people didn't want to go to church because of these guys. And as we look around, and, and, and I, as I think about the, the, the nature of church these days, there's still that responsibility that I have, that those in church leadership have, to do what? To discipline even those, and especially those in ministry. That means we can't just turn a blind eye to, to failure, to moral failure, to sin when it happens, wherever it happens, especially in church leadership. I mean, we've, we've seen and what's happening in the Catholic Church and things just get brushed under the carpet and we don't want to deal with them. And I'm not, I'm not throwing stones. I'm just saying this is, what's on, this is what the world sees. The world sees, though, we, we protect, though, we guard those that are sinning in our midst. And, and uh, you know, again, we don't go after sin with this vengeance. We come, you know, if, the Bible says if you see someone overtaken in a fault, it doesn't say just brush it under the carpet, forget about it, you know, well, it's going to be too much trouble to address it. It says you go, it says you, it doesn't say go to the pastor, put it on Facebook, get it out, a Twitter feed. It doesn't say any of that. It says you go to them with a spirit of meekness, gently. That's our goal in church is that we, you know, we have this place with each other to correct. And for me in leadership, you know, the church, no, like, if I, if I am doing something that's out of line, someone should say something because it affects the whole church. Paul's going to tell the church in Corinth, look, you got to purge out the leaven. There's a lot of bad stuff happening, and that's to be taken care of. Now, again, we don't run around sin sniffing. We don't run around pointing fingers, but there's a responsibility for church discipline. Because that, and we, we don't want to have a, ne that's not negative. Please, please, please understand, church discipline is not a bad word. It's, listen, I know what happens. It has been done heartlessly in legalistic churches. And that's not right either. There's a place for grace and a desire and a heart for repentance and restoration and, and, and long-suffering through these things. But it doesn't mean, the, the other extreme is to just we'll brush it under the carpet, we ignore it, we, we just hope it'll go away. It doesn't go away. So when church discipline, when it's done well with that heart of gentleness, with Matthew 18 in mind, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. When this happens, some of the most beautiful uh, events I've seen occur within the church have been following a series of, of church discipline, 
And then when both parties really are seeking the Lord, and there's restoration, there's repentance, there's reconciliation, and sometimes relationships. I've had it in my life. After going through a period where there was a, there was a conflict, then the relationship is actually stronger. You know, scar tissue is stronger than the original skin. And what's scar tissue but a sign of a past hurt that's been healed? And it's stronger. And so we see that, that God sort of, this is why he's judging Eli. There was a responsibility to restrain. There was a responsibility to take action. And he didn't do it. He was passive. Moms and dads, too many passive moms and dads. We can take this down to the home level for a minute. Here's the problem at home. If you don't restrain yourself, how are you going to restrain your kids? And so a lot of parents, you can't discipline your kids because you do the same thing. So it takes, first of all, our own, you know, we have to be attentive to the voice of God. We have to be following the Lord. And then we can look back at our kids and say, well, you know, here, here's what we do. Here's how this works. Here's what obedience to authority looks like. Look at us following the Lord. Look at your mom and I. Look at your dad and I. Look at my, me as a single parent. And, and confess, you know, there's a beautiful thing, even for you as a parent, there's a beautiful thing when you can confess to your own kids. Look, daddy was wrong when he yelled at you like that. I may have been right what I said, but I was wrong to lose my temper that way. You didn't deserve to be shamed publicly by me. And so you can, as the Lord leads, you can, what a great thing to model for your kids. Godly repentance and forgiveness and those things. They're, they're, beautiful, they're beautiful things, but we tend to, anyway, I'm off on a tangent. Now let's get back. Verse 14. Eli couldn't restrain his own kids because I don't know if he could have restrained himself. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Uh, there is a time when the time is past. And there's a time for us when the time is, we live in this age of grace right now. We have an atoning sacrifice for our sin. But there will come a time when God will reopen his uh, plan of, of judgment on the earth, the time of the tribulation. Uh, that's another sermon for another time. But for now, hey, there is no reason to live in unforgiven sin. There's no reason to live apart from God. He has opened every door. He has cleared the path so anybody can come to him and receive atonement, can receive forgiveness. But for Eli, in this situation, uh, the die had been cast, so to speak. So this is what God tells Samuel. Uh, God, you got a different, what's option B? Can you give me a different sermon? Like that's a judgment sermon for Eli. I'm not sure I want to preach that one out of the starting gate. Can you, can you imagine? So watch what happens. So Samuel laid down until morning. Can you imagine if he slept very much that night? This is rolling around in his mind. And then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. So he gets up in the morning. Evidently, it's his responsibility to get, get the, the church doors open, so to speak. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. I'll bet he was. No one, no one likes to tell a person that they're under the judgment of God. I mean, that's not a happy thing we do. And, and unfortunately, many churches have ceased to do that. Coming to church now is just a, a self-help program, but never a discussion of repentance of sin. Like, you know, I'd love to see God bless you, but if you're gonna live in sin, I'm not sure I can say that. But if you're gonna reject God, what, what do you want me to do? You know, you sort of need to get right with God. You need to repent and come to God. We can talk then, but you know, otherwise, without God, I can't give you any hope apart from God. So Samuel lay down till morning, opens the houses of, of the tabernacle, then the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision, and then Eli called Samuel and said, Ah, oh, Samuel, my son. He's had his morning coffee. He's up and about, evidently, got himself out of bed, uh, got his cane or his walker, whatever he's got. And uh, maybe in a, in a faint vision, he sees, you know, Samuel, he hears the curtains open in the tabernacle, and he says, oh, Samuel, my son. And Samuel's probably trying to hide, you know, somewhere behind the menorah. And he said, uh, 
so Samuel, verse 17, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? I mean, I wonder if Eli is a little suspicious about what, you know, what, what in the world did God say? Why didn't God come to me? Why didn't God tell me? Why does he go to Samuel? Isn't that funny how God does that sometimes? Think about David and his sin and how God came to Nathan the prophet. Nathan approaches David with this whole story about a guy that has a sheep and another guy who's got lots of sheep and he steals this guy's sheep and says, David, what do you think of that? And David said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, well, David, that man is you. Sometimes when God can't get to you directly, he'll come to you through somebody else, a prophetic voice, someone who comes with the word of God for you. And so here he uses, he's using Samuel and Samuel's not so sure about this. Uh, so Eli says, so, you know, what, so what did God have to say last night? I know God was talking to you. Uh, what do you have to say? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Hey, he sort of puts him uh, under an oath, so to speak. Hey, God do so to you and more if you hide it from me. Uh, now, now Samuel's in a tough spot. He's got to come clean. He was a little bit afraid of what he had to say and so verse 18 says, then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. He, he came out with the whole thing. Now, aren't you, I mean, aren't you glad that we see Samuel then when he's confronted, say, hey, what did God say? That he tells him the truth. He doesn't hold back anything. Again, this is sort of the obligation I'm under as a pastor. Uh, we go through this, we talk about this, and I, and I just say this not by way of, again, puffing ourselves up as a church, not by saying, hey, we got it the right way and other people have it the wrong way. What I'm saying is, as I read the Word of God and I read the passage that says all Scripture is God-inspired and profitable, and I read the passage in the Psalms that says the entirety of the Word of God is truth, and as I read Paul saying to the Ephesian elders, I've not withheld anything from you, I've not held back anything from you, then I go, well, I, I guess there's really, I'm sort of bound to say, this is the word, is this, if this is the word of God, we sort of go through it verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Not because, that, that's really not a, you don't have to be a genius to do that. It just says now we're going to let God speak to us from every page of this book. I can't say to you, well, you know, uh, Leviticus, that's not, that's not really important for you. J. Vernon McGee said if he could preach from one book of the Bible, it'd be Leviticus. The whole of the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice is Jesus is laid out for us in Leviticus. And I remember hearing a pastor tell me, we'll never study the book of Leviticus in our church. That, and I thought, how sad. Well, that's Old Testament. Really? Oh, we don't, there's, a, there's an understanding that we don't, that the Old Testament, that's for another time, another place. You wouldn't have a New Testament if it wasn't for the Old Testament. You wouldn't understand the New Testament if it wasn't for the Old Testament. And all the quotes from the New Testament are from the Old Testament. And the God of the Old Testament is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not the I was, he's the I am. So we believe that God, the same God, worked in the Old Testament, works in the New Testament. But, but the Old Testament God was not a gracious God, wasn't he? Does he reveal his glory to Moses and says, you know, Moses, I'll show you my glory. I'm going to hide you in a rock and cover you up, and I'm going to, you're going to see my afterglow. You're going to see my, my, uh, my thrusters going as I go by. So the Lord, the Lord God, abounding in grace, abounding in mercy, all that from the Old Testament, fantastic. That's why we're here Wednesday night, right? Because we like the Old Testament. So he doesn't hold back anything from Samuel or from uh, Eli. And then what's Eli's response? He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Eli seems to have some kind of recognition. Uh, is he just kind of resigned to the fact that this is what God is doing? Uh, he's understood this is, you know, this is what God has said. And, and you, you know, when, when God talks about his judgment, and when we think about God's judgment, his judgment, his judgment is always just. He is always a just God. He's not just God. He's always a just God. You know, a lot of times 
people will ask, you know, funerals are tough. I mean, funerals are tough times because people want to know, where's my relative? Where's my friend? Where's my so-and-so? You know, and we don't know what the Lord does in a person's heart uh, before the time of death. And I'm not the judge. But usually what I say to people is, look, here's what I know. I know God is love, and I know God is just. And whatever determination he makes, whatever decision he makes, you or that person or me or anybody else, no one would argue with it. It would be clear and just and righteous. Will not the, the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer is yes. So is, it, is he wrong to judge Eli? Not at all. Not at all. And I think Eli understands that and he knows that. Let him do what seems, if it seems good to God, it's good. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. Man, is, that's a breath of fresh air into all the corruption and all the darkness. God is going to pick this young man and young boy and going to raise him up. And the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. I mean, he was so attuned to the word of God that by the time we end this chapter, it says the word of Samuel came to all Israel. It's almost like the word of God and the word of Samuel were inseparable. If Samuel said it, it's because God said it. And if God said it, Samuel would say it. And everything that Samuel said hit its target. I thought about an archer shooting arrows. You know, if, that, if the arrow falls short, it hits the ground. If you're throwing something at a target, it hits the ground if it falls short. But every word of Samuel, like an arrow, is going to hit its target. None of them are going are to fall short. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. So you see uh, the contrast that's made. Before this, there was no widespread revelation. Now God is going to raise up this boy to be one of the most powerful prophets that has ever, uh, ever lived and, and, and served in the nation of Israel. And it's going to be widespread. You see that from Dan to Beersheba, that's all of Israel, is going to know about uh, Samuel and his prophecy and great stuff. So we're not going to have time to get into chapter 4 tonight, but uh, we'll save that for next week. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we close up once again your word, I pray that we too would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us in this season of our lives. Lord, I pray that we'd be able to turn off all of the external stimulus that the TV and the, the internet and the streaming video and the YouTube and all that, Lord, that we would find time to be alone with you and silent, that you'd speak to us even in our bed and we'd have ears to hear, that we'd know your voice and we would say with Samuel, speak, Lord. Your servant listens. Lord, open our eyes to see wondrous things from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. All right. Don't forget about saying hi, bye, what's the word with Cindy on your way out.